Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Sebastian Esser. Sebastian is a journalist and entrepreneur in Berlin, Germany. He is the founder of Crowd Reporter, a member-funded digital magazine, and also of Steady, a membership platform for independent publishers. Crowd Reporter was crowdfunded in 2014 and publishes one story a day on politics and society. It specializes in ad-free, independent and engaged journalism and has 17,000 paying members today. Steady was founded in 2017 and helps independent publishers to easily launch membership programs. It has paid out more than 20 million euros to 1,500 publications across Europe so far. Okay, Sebastian, you know about our three plus one format. Uh, you get three questions and one soapbox moment. So let's start with question one. What does protecting media freedom mean to you? Thank you, Carolyn. Um, so I'm a journalist, as you said, so media freedom or freedom of expression means uh, the world to me, <laughs> means everything to me. We need it uh, as journalists to do our jobs. Um, and I think we all we, in Europe, we sh should not be only be able to say what we want to. We should also have equal opportunities to distribute these, you know, um, uh, things that we want to say. Uh, in a fair way. It should not be a matter of money, power, influence. Um, that should have zero impact on our ability to, to reach our, our readers, listeners, uh, and, and communities online. So uh, since I'm from Germany, um, you may think or your viewers, listeners may feel like uh, it's not really a problem in Germany. And I agree that it's much worse in other countries. For example, I'm on the board of Direct 36 in Hungary. And what our colleagues over there are going through is um, um, is abhorring. Uh, so I absolutely feel like the EU can play a role in fixing the situation in Hungary, but also in other uh, countries, for example, in Poland. Um, but not all is well in Germany, uh, as, and I want to tell you a story uh, that I experienced myself uh, last year, and you probably haven't heard about it because uh, the media hasn't reported on it, which is problem number one, right? So there was a plan by the federal government, uh, you remember it was a conservative social democratic grand coalition before the last elections, to pay out subsidies to legacy media, to help them fund distribution of printed newspapers. You know, what's not to like? <laughs> well, it wasn't supposed to go into, into the distribution, but it was for a quote unquote innovation, which mm -hmm. included you could buy uh, VR goggles, you could buy a new CMS system, you could buy hardware, you could buy Facebook ads, uh, Google ads, like marketing stuff. Everything that we as digital publishers have to pay for ourselves, even though we don't have the uh, legacy income streams, right? So we're startups, we're starting from scratch. It, media making money with journalism is hard, as everyone I hope knows. Um, and um, so um, why were people who already have enough money or who you know had the last 20, 30 years to to um to to do their homework why are there now being handed 220 million euros that was the plan so it's a huge sum of money right even even in a big media market like germany the legacy media would get that money new digital media such as my publication crowd reporter but also the hundreds of publications that use the company that i co-founded steady they would get zero <laughs> is that fair no, it's not fair. And maybe you could say, well, you know, another uh, uh, guy complaining about uh, not getting uh, the money that other people get. <laughs> True. But this is about media. This is about freedom of speech, right? This is not just like any other industry. It should not concern the state, uh, how I conduct my business, how I am able to um, 
to distribute my content and uh, uh, especially the state should not be able to favor some media over others and that's what happened and what's especially spicy about that situation is the money would have to be would have uh, been paid out in the six weeks just before the election <laughs> and now you can imagine you know regional newspapers are usually mon uh, monopolists like all over europe in their uh in the in the voting districts so politicians handing out cash to the only people who uh report on them on a local level call it what you want i i, I won't use words but uh, uh but 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 we didn't feel it's fair and you have to imagine we closed our revenue our complete revenue last year was a million euros we're really proud of that right we're we are a um we're a profitable company but sorry excuse my french that's that's chicken shit compared to the uh, to the to the media industry as a whole right so we had to go take out several percentage of our of our annual revenue hire a constitutional lawyer, get him to write a letter to the uh, minister um, of the economy. Um, uh, and as soon as the letter arrived, this law was dead. So it was unconstitutional. They just didn't do their homework or they didn't care. And that's the real problem. I don't really feel like it was, um, they were trying to, you know, um, trick, uh, trick new digital companies or something. They just don't care. It's not part of their uh, daily lives. And they did, don't realize that this kind of stuff is really hurting innovation, is hurting uh, new media, but is hurting press freedom, uh, and not only in Germany, but also in, in the European Union. And I only wish that this kind of thing doesn't happen. As you well know, it has happened before in other contexts on a European level, just because um, the... Um, Distribution of influence is not evenly distributed in Brussels. Um, um, and again, this sounds a little bit um, over the top, but uh, I, if, if you think about it uh, and what influence comp companies like Axel Springer, the biggest German media company, have in Brussels, I'm sure you will agree that I don't have the phone number of Ursula von der Leyen, right? And even if I had it, she would hang up. She does seem to speak, well, we don't know because she apparently she deletes her messages, but she does seem to speak to Axel Springer uh, uh, personnel, uh, as you can tell by them being the personal uh, consultants, an ex-built uh, uh, editor-in-chief is consulting her on social media strategy uh, on her own costs. So um, I don't think I'm imagining things, right? I just wanna you know, plead your listeners to think about where they get the information from, and maybe, you know, Politico, for example, is an Axel Springer uh, um, company or an out news outlet built, which is usually influential in political circles for whatever reason, as an Axel Springer media. That's where the information comes from a lot, and I would just like to ask your your listeners, your re your um, viewers to reconsider whether they're really seeing the, the full picture here. Thank you, Sebastian. That was that was very um, uh, concrete in terms of, of, of answer. And, and I think um, I'm hoping uh, that more and more, thanks to investigative journalists uh, like yourselves and others, these type of um, um, imbalances, let's say, of influence uh, come to the fore. They might not come through traditional press, but maybe the alternative uh, press will be able to, to highlight those more. Um, I think what, um, you know, have, having said what the, the shortcomings uh, are, we can switch to question two, which is what should the EU legislators and maybe also the national legislators do or do better to protect media freedom? Let me only speak about Germany because, uh, as I said, um, those questions are much um, more um, pressing in other European countries, which is which is bad enough. But I don't feel like I'm competent to talk about this. I feel like in in, in Germany and other Western uh, European countries, uh, governments should be careful to just keep their hands off. 
Um, and uh, that's it's always been true, but at the moment, um, uh, several things are happening at the same time. One, um, media is being dragged into the urge to regulate social media, which you know makes a lot of sense, and uh, and there's certainly uh, a, a lot of sensible things to discuss here, but that should not affect journalism. Um, uh, that's that's point number one. Um, point number two, and that's more about myself and, and 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 the media that I represent and other medias like us. We are being left out. Our voices are not being heard. It's partly our own fault because we're not as big and we haven't organized our lobbying uh, the way we could. Uh, but the reason for that is also um, funding, right? We're just a mm -hmm. uh, we're we're uh, we're just starting out. We just don't have the revenues. We can't afford to send dozens of um, of representatives to Brussels or to our to our um, capitals and make our voices heard. And so that means that these new media voices out there don't have a place at the table many times at the moment, at least in Germany, and I'm sure it's it's similar in Brussels. And I feel that's a problem if you just want to find the best solution, right? Um, so what's the situation for us is that we're being squeezed between two hugely influ influential pressure groups, influential through money and through uh, through uh, like public influence, and that is big media and big tech. And these dinosaurs are kind of fighting a fight uh, among themselves, right? I've, I've just had a conversation with an American journalist talking about how how big media companies, European media companies are paid huge sums of money by by big American tech companies, especially uh, as as you well know, um, uh, has been the case where 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 you know huge sums of money, uh, both on European but also national levels, are uh, being handed over from the likes of Facebook and Google to traditional media companies. Um, and he said, "Well, okay, the word for that is extortion." <laughs> And I have to say, I agree, right? Um, there's there's enormous political pressure, enormous political capital is being spent by the publishing industry, by big big media, by big legacy media, on kind of forcing politics or asking politics to put pressure on 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 the big technology companies, which are American, um, to hand over some money because they're uh, all traditional. Um, business models don't work anymore. And, you know, this, again, this fight, I don't really know what's going on, but all I know is that nobody is talking to us in all of this. And that leads to digital media that is new, that is a, a startup that is not very um, stable yet and doesn't have a, like a stable revenue f uh, flow yet that we're being left out a lot of the times. We're not getting the money, but we're also not getting all of the um, infrastructure deals that are being struck are kind of um, behind our backs, I would say. So if you think of things like Facebook News, Google News, these are special, I, I would call them places on these, um, on these digital platforms that have huge reach all over Europe that are exclusive for big legacy media companies. It's really hard for a small newsletter a blog a um a podcast and this is what especially i have to uh, say this is also a generational problem right younger people are reading listening viewing other sources of news and they're not being represented here because we we, we are not organized as as we are so again this is partly our own fault but on the other hand it's also re the responsibility i feel of european politics to make sure that all the interests uh, especially, you know, the public interest of of having um, of having good information on, on any level, including local and digital, for younger people as well as older generations, are being taken into account when striking those deals and not uh, continuing this kind of um, uh, almost like a bystander role of European politics uh, between big tech and big media fighting their fights and using political influence as a weapon. Yeah, I think I think um, 
it is interesting to see that on on the one hand you don't get a seat at the table when uh policy discussions uh, are are done and then you don't get a seat at the table when business deals are being done um and and in terms i think of um you know small and innovative publishers not organizing themselves enough i think probably the truth is that when you are an innovative startup, your priority is being an innovative startup, not being a lobbyist. <laughs> Whereas maybe the legacy um, um, press has uh, puts less energy in, in, in innovating and maybe more uh, energy in, in lobbying. Um, that's, that's probably uh, the trade-off that, that, that is happening there. So I don't think it's a fault of small innovative uh, publishers and, and um, new initiatives to not be lobbying, I think it's a very healthy attitude for them. It's just that you can't afford it <laughs> to, to ignore it. Yeah, yeah we don't um, have the time yet. That's all. We don't have the resources, the people exactly. to do that kind of work. Um, yeah, um, and, and I think it's always a failure on innovation when the next hire is not an engineer, but it's a lobbyist or a lawyer. That <laughs> means usually that something is going wrong or a journalist. Uh, you know, journalists and engineers should be the innovators, not not um, lobbyists trying to get a better deal. Let's put it mm -hmm. that way. Um, that brings me to question three, which you, you've highlighted some aspects, but what are the pitfalls that EU legislators or German legislators, for that matter, should avoid when trying to protect the media and our freedoms? Yeah, so let me put it this way. I think it's really important to not think about the past uh, uh, in, uh, when you think about the media structure in Europe at the moment. Um, what I've um, experienced time and time again that regulation at that discussion within you know media and political circles are all about the printed newspaper and how important it is for democracy, whereas readers are usually uh, much more modern in their behavior than people think. Uh, let me talk about my parents for a second. <laughs> so my dad is, is in his mid-70s. Uh, of course, he has a smartphone. He reads on his iPad and his, his, his computer. My mom does. Of course, she does. Do they still read their printed newspapers? Yeah, sure. That's what they used to. But if that were to go away, it's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean that democracy will die. But what's happening on a political level is that the fight of the legacy media to protect their income streams leads to an argument where, um, where they say protect democracy by giving us money so we can distribute printed newspapers. And that's just plain stupid because by doing that, you're just... Um, um, slowing down the um, change process that is in the uh, in the works anyway right yeah. uh, and if 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 you uh, if I said before that uh, all of the big tech companies who are responsible for the distribution nowadays are American well that's one of the reasons because Europe is always behind and uh, politics should absolutely be careful and that's probably the pitfall that I that you ask for to not be conservative and to not kind of um, stabilize, um, especially in the media industry, stabilize um, a structure that is has to be overcome as quickly as possible so we can innovate, that we can make money uh, and kind of make, make journalism truly independent by, uh, by getting um, independent income streams, independent from governments, from uh, from from big companies who buy advertisement in place. People are willing to pay, as, as, as any media manager nowadays luckily will be able to tell you, um, but not if we have to be uh, cheaper than, um, than newspapers that get subsidies from the government for distributing uh, newspapers or for buying the art goggles. Uh, uh, you know, that's almost ridiculous. And that's really something that I feel is almost laziness, right? Any a straight thinking politician of any political color will uh, agree that buying uh, big media houses who can absolutely afford to go to media market and buy themselves 
uh, a VR goggle if they want to. <laughs> that should not be done by tax money. Uh, when you know when this stuff happens, something is really going on. So let's kind of talk on a high level. Let's talk about the future. Let's talk about change and how to make it uh, faster so that we can maybe someday talk to European big platforms and not American or in the future Chinese ones, which will be much faster. And if we had 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 this conversation a year ago, we probably wouldn't have taken uh, TikTok as seriously, whereas now TikTok is probably becoming the main um, distribution channel, especially for younger generations, but also, also for older ones. Well, what is the EU going to do then? And why don't we have our own Facebook, TikTok, and Google? And no, it's not going to come from uh, an EU-funded initiative on a kind of state level, right? Uh, that's always kind of the go-to answer here. That's not going to work. <laughs> let's, let's cut that discussion short. Um, it's going to come from private companies who have a chance uh, in a fair fight. Um, and politics' role, uh, in my opinion, should be to keep the fight fair, to let the new innovators play on the same uh, level uh, like the old uh, influential media brands. Again, Axel Springer owns Bild, owns Politico, consults the commission, uh, the president of the European Commission on her PR strategy, apparently has her private phone number. That's not the way to, to go about here. I think um, if, if, if you want to regulate media um, and, and, and help journalism, it needs to happen in a different way. So that's that's a lot of, of pitfalls to avoid, but I, I'll just summarize them in, in two key words, which is um, fairness and future. Uh, I mean, basically, you're not asking for much. You're not asking for a preferential treatment. You're just asking to be treated in a similar fashion to uh, legacy um, consortiums. And... Um, and I think the point about future is, is also a very important one because certainly in Brussels, we know that policy makers tend to regulate with current models in, in, in their heads. You know, they, they regulate what they know, <laughs> basically. And, and um, it's very difficult, obviously, to try to be neutral in the way you uh, create policy and not to go towards a certain model or a certain technology. But... Uh, a lot of the legislation would probably be better if it was a bit more neutral and was more forward-looking than than um, preserving status quo. Yeah, but this um, is also something that I sometimes don't understand because especially politicians are really savvy in using social media. They usually don't have to have their news printed out, right? They're completely capable of reading online news. Uh, as I said, Politico is completely digital. So they know what they're talking about but when it comes to regulation and who gets uh who gets preferential treatment who gets subsidies who gets uh kind of uh um, political power to put pressure on big platforms it's the old media so something's not right here i mean if you're a politician ask yourself if that's your daily media use usage you know is, is that how you um, use media and now think about the next five or ten years is that really something that we should keep doing in the European Union or shouldn't we start thinking about other models and maybe innovation and dynamic models that may also be more interesting for um, markets outside of Europe so that we can keep um, being influential in the world instead of just being receivers of American or Chinese um, distribution channels. That's that, that's a very fair point. Um, I think you're you're on a roll now to switch to the last element of this exercise, which is this, what what I call the soap box moment, where you basically um, stand on a box and uh, for two minutes uh, deliver a message uh, to the powers that be. Um, you have Roberta for the European Parliament. You have Ursula, whom you have mentioned a couple of times. Uh, for the commission and I would say um, I'm giving you the floor and be as convincing as you can so that um, you know the your lack of lobbying resources are now compensated by these two minutes <laughs> okay let me let me uh, talk to Ursula von der Leyen as a fellow German um, 
Frau von der Leyen, I don't have your phone number. <laughs> Please send me your phone number. Uh, people who have your phone number are not the ones that you should exclusively talk to when it comes to the media, uh, uh, future of, of media, to the future of journalism. There's hundreds and thousands of outlets being set up every day, not only in Germany, but all over Europe. We talk to each other. I mean, these new media are truly European players. Uh, we have friends and partners all over the continent. Well, I would like to tell you about them <laughs> i would like to uh, we, we don't have to talk on the phone actually that would make me a little bit uncomfortable maybe but let's not only talk to axel springer uh let's also talk to small new media outlets let's talk to startups who without um uh, all too much fantasy some of them will become big players will make sure that democracy through um, you know journalism through independent uh, reporting through research through holding the powerful and influential to account and you only need to uh, look to to places like poland and and hungary where brave journalists are kind of the last bearers of democracy at the moment um, to, to see that this is not any industry, right? This not should not be treated like gigantic corporations fighting it out on a political level. Also, I feel like this is not your, this is this is not what politics is all about, right? You're the bearers of, um, uh, you're the representatives of of the European people, and it shouldn't be um, uh, just a bystander in a in a big dinosaur fight where where one puts a uh, political pressure on the other the other one tries to bribe their way out of that pressure and then in the end a deal gets made uh, in the uh, in the in the shadows of european politics on the backs of of innovation on the backs of new independent social uh, uh, social media and digital media who who don't have the uh, uh, um, economic strength yet because they just don't have uh, decades of uh, of huge profits uh, uh, on their bank accounts. Uh, so let's let's play fair. Let's let's talk about the real issues and let's not just be a bystander in a fight that should not be happening anyway. I think that was a, a very strong uh, message, Sebastian. Um, I'm hoping that uh, Ursula and, and Roberta were listening, and certainly Ursula, seeing she's your main target as a German uh, politician. Um, I, I hope that in the Media Freedom Act discussions that will come up, um, your, your plea for transparency, level playing field, um, innovative uh, approaches will be heard. Um, we will certainly do our best to put it on social media and put it out there. And uh, who knows if we tag uh, Ursula on Twitter, maybe you will get her phone number <laughs> via DM and, uh, or, or you could uh, meet her in Germany somewhere. Um, we, we certainly think that would be a, a welcome um, outcome of this conversation because the more voices are heard in Brussels, I think the more chance we have that legislation that is adopted really serves uh, public interest and general interest rather than the interest of a few, to put it that way. Thank you so much, Sebastian. That was really useful. And um, I think we will have uh, quite a few other podcasts with uh, hopefully innovative players that will be able to share their views too, so that, you know, with our small means, your voices get heard in Brussels. You're welcome, you so Carolyn, much. and uh, thank you so much uh, for, you know, uh, asking for my inner lobbyist. <laughs> it makes me feel slightly uncomfortable, but um, I actually feel this important, so I'm happy to raise my voice here, and thank you for giving me this platform.